Hello, Anna Kappa. This is the Visitor Center. Well, hello, Visitor Center. Hi, Bonnie. How are you today? We're doing great, thank you. <laughs> Me too. We're doing great down here in the landing cove off Anna Kappa Island. My name is Ranger Dave. I'm a park ranger here at Channel Islands National Park, or as I like to say in these programs, underneath Channel Islands National Park. And I want to welcome everybody watching today to Channel Islands Live. So we have a group in our auditorium in our visitor center in Ventura, including kids from the Ventura Sail and Kayak Camp. So Bonnie, let me hear a big hello from everybody in Ventura. All right, fun day out there enjoying the ocean, and now we're going to show you a little bit about what's underneath it. We also have visitors here on Anacapa Island, and our moderator on the island, Kathleen, let me hear a big hello from everybody who came out today on the Vanguard to visit okay, Anacapa. Yeah, say hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> And welcome to all of you watching us live over the internet as well. And a big thank you to our tech partners, Ventura County Office of Education, and Explore.org for helping make that possible. And I'd also like to dedicate this program today to a very special friend of ours, Joe, part of our team, always down here with us, Mr. Joe. Well, welcome. So here we are in the half of Channel Islands National Park that is seldom seen. Half of this park is underwater. We're not just comprised of five islands, but also the waters that surround them. And also these waters are part of Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. So these are protected waters. But the spot that my cameraman, Josh, and I and our support divers are diving in today is also protected because it is part of a marine reserve. It might be surprising to you that fishing is allowed in a national park and marine sanctuary, but only 20% of the waters surrounding the islands that make up this park are protected from fishing. And this particular spot has been protected as a reserve for over 30 years. And it means that this spot has a more naturally functioning ecosystem than areas around here that are not protected in the same way where fishing occurs. It also makes it more resilient to changes that occur. And we're going to see a couple of those changes today. But it's not completely immune to outside influences. And so we'll see what some of the threats are, even to this area, and maybe some of the things that you all can do, simple little things to help protect not just this area, but the oceans in general. So, Bonnie, let's start with our audience in Ventura, and I'm diving in a forest. Can you guys shout out, what kind of forest am I diving in today? Forest. Oh. Oh. Now, a lot of people are familiar with kelp from the big piles of dead, rotting kelp that wash up on the beaches in Southern California, and they actually do serve a purpose. They're food for some animals, and down here in the kelp forest, it's a very different experience with kelp. You can see these beautiful shots Josh is giving you of how it flows back and forth with the water streaming towers of golden kelp down here and the kelp you see is one of many species that are down here but it is the primary structure of this forest and it's perfectly adapted to this underwater environment and i'll show you a few ways how it is so on land where trees are the primary structure of those forests the trees typically have stiff, rigid trunks, but here underwater where the ocean is moving all the time, and there's a little bit of surge that's picked up since we've been here today, an adaptation that kelp has is that it has flexible, pliable stipes, 
as opposed to a rigid trunk. And so it can flow back and forth with the motion of the ocean. It also has leaf-like blades, and these and the stipes can draw nutrients right out of the water. How many of you think kelp has a root system to pull nutrients out of the sandy bottom here? We're People are saying no. no. You guys know about kelp. That's right. <laughs> so a land forest, the nutrients are mostly, if not all, the soil, so roots draw them up into the plant. Kelp, which is actually an algae, not a plant, because here there are more nutrients in the water than in the bottom, absorb it right from the water itself. Kelp has one other really interesting adaptation. Here's a great shot of some new growth. You can see these little and the getting larger bulbous features, these gas-filled bladders, and they actually serve a very important purpose. Does anyone know what purpose these bladders perform for kelp? And Kathleen, let's go to the island audience. Does someone here know what that might be? <laughs> Did you hear that, Dave? No, you'll have to repeat, please. They make it, they make it float. It floats, yeah. So kelp can grow up to 100 feet or more in length and spread out like a canopy on the surface. And Bonnie, we'll go back to Ventura. Why does kelp float up? Why is it, what's it reaching for at the surface? Josh is giving you a big clue right now. Sunlight. Sunlight, exactly. So even though we're underwater, different environment, Sunlight is really the beginning of the food chain of the web of life here. And kelp uses that process that I think you all know about called photosynthesis, just like land plants do, to convert sunlight into energy. And it brings it down here into the kelp forest. And it's the beginning of this intricate web of life with over a thousand different types of plants, algaes, and animals that rely on kelp and the kelp forest for both food and habitat. And so today, we're live. We never know what we're really going to see, but we're counting on our support divers to find some of those animals that rely on kelp and see if we can take a look at how they've adapted to life in the kelp forest. So why don't we, let's see, Josh, I'm just looking for a really nice spot. Maybe we'll drop down, how about over here? And we'll see what our divers have. In fact, I see right now that our support driver, Julian, and let me bring him on in, has found one of the animals that gives us a little bit of the story about how the kelp forest functions. And so he's just making his way in. And while he's doing that, I'll pick up this little bit of drift kelp. And thank you, Julian. Actually, I don't need the drift kelp because this urchin has it. So you can see this is a sea urchin. Does anyone know what kind of sea urchin I'm holding? Bonnie, how about someone in Ventura? Stand by. Okay. Spiny black. Spiny black. Spiny black is a good question. A good answer. Spiny for sure. It's actually a red. Uh, yeah, it is. It's a red sea urchin, and these are very common here. This is. Julian also found this. This is called a test. It's actually a shell. So this is what's inside, and you can see all the little little dots on it is where the spines hook into. And on the bottom, you can see the hole. That's where the mouth would be. So this is the inside. I'm going to put this down and show you the living animal. These are grazers. So this urchin has actually caught a little piece of drift kelp, just like I did a minute ago. But I'm not going to eat that kelp. This sea urchin probably is going to eat this kelp. These spines are somewhat flexible, and it can move that kelp around. And I'll show you what the mouth looks like. 
let me know if you can see. Kathleen, are we able to see that mouth? Yeah, you got a good picture of the okay, mouth. Good. And so it'll actually move. I can't see it yet. Can you see it? Yeah, I can now. Okay. <laughs> and so it'll actually move that kelp to the mouth, and it will use its two feet and its spines to get it around there, and then it'll eat the kelp. So this is a grazing animal, and while it doesn't look like something you might want to eat, there are fish down here. There's one called a sheephead in particular that can bite through these spines and eat that urchin. But who else eats urchins? Bonnie, does someone in Ventura want to give a guess as to what other animal likes to eat sea urchin? Starfish? You know, someone this morning said the same thing. Sea stars don't really eat sea urchins. They'll eat mussels, things like that, but not, not sea urchins. People. People, that's a great answer. People. Sometimes people say sea otters, which also eat these, but people eat these. You can find them in sushi bars, and it's called uni. And so, what effect do you think people eating sea urchins might have on the balance of life, life in the kelp forest? Kathleen, let's go to the audience. <laughs> help in front of my face. To the island audience. Any them to disappear? Guess it loud. Cause them to disappear. Cause them to disappear. So, if we take too many of these out of the areas where they're allowed to be fished, not here in the reserve, they'll disappear. And so they play a role in grazing on that drift kelp. But a bigger thing that occurs is that their smaller cousin, the purple sea urchin, will take their place, will fill that void. And purple sea urchins, people don't eat them. They're too small to be commercially viable. Well, purple urchins, they don't just eat the drift kelp. They'll actually attack the structure of the kelp that holds it to the rocks. So those hundred foot towers of kelp will just drift away and be completely gone. They'll destroy an entire kelp forest if their numbers get out of balance. And so fishing, overfishing I should say, is one of the threats to the kelp forest. Luckily we're at a preserve and if people follow the rules, this area will be safe from that. So I'm actually going to give this urchin back to Julian because we don't want to do any damage here. And I don't want to give one of those sheephead a free lunch. So we'll put that urchin back in a crevice where it'll be nice and safe. And while we're doing that, I'll bring Julian right back in. Good day. Yeah. One of our other answers from one of the gentlemen here said sea otters eat them also. Sea otters do eat them. They're now not here. part of the environment. And there are a few sea otters here, but they were pretty much hunted out of existence by the 1800s in Southern California. So they're starting to make their way back a little bit. and uh, But they, again, are part of the natural balance of the kelp forest. In fact, in Central California, where there are sea otters, the kelp forests are really thick and lush. Now, this animal, this is something different, Bonnie. Let's go to Ventura. Does anybody have a guess as to what I'm holding in my hand? A sea snail? Sea snail's a good guess, but there's no shell on this guy. Anyone else? Sea slug. Sea slug. So, this is called a sea hare. It's a type of sea slug. It actually does have a micro shell. It's sort of that link between snails and slugs. And you can see it's rabbit-like ears, which is why it's called a sea hare. And this is also a grazer. And people don't really eat these, so it's not really threatened by fishing, but it is threatened by things like if the water temperature were to change too much, it's adapted to this water temperature here in the 50s and 60s that kelp thrives in as well. But an interesting thing about sea hares is that they will lay a lot of eggs. The eggs look like masses of spaghetti, and they're very prolific. They breed quite a bit. This is a little one. They can get very large, maybe four or five times as big as this. And it's said that if every sea hare leg aid, every sea hare egg laid, hatched and grew to maturity and laid more eggs, a little water moving on us, and all those eggs hatched, 
It would only take about six months to cut, cover the entire planet several feet deep in sea hairs. So, so that's a lot of sea hairs. Most of those eggs turn into food for other animals. That's part of life in the ocean as well. But it's another part of the story of reserves because the larger most sea life gets and the older it gets, the more it reproduces. And so allowing animals like this to grow to maturity and become large helps to keep the oceans populated with animals, helps to keep the balance of life in the proper perspective. So let's go ahead. I'm just going to put this sea hair down and let it get back to grazing. It's actually <laughs> it's stuck pretty good onto my club, but once I put it on the ground, it'll release and... There it goes. I think it's already eating. <laughs> and um, so we've seen a couple of the animals so far, and we've talked a little bit about one of the threats to the kelp forest, which is overfishing. Bonnie, does anyone in Ventura have any ideas as to what another threat might be to the kelp forest? Another threat to the kelp forest? Pollution. Pollution, yeah, that's a big one. So we're offshore, and, oh my god, while I'm talking, Andrea's found something really interesting. So let's come back to pollution, and in the meantime, let me go ahead and get a hold of this animal. Thanks, Andrea. So everybody just shout out. I think you all know what I'm holding here. Shark. Shark. Now this in particular is called a horn shark. You can see the horn on its fin here, which is where it gets its name. There's another one on the rear fin. And they're bottom feeders. I'll show you the mouth on the bottom of the animal. And they eat small mollusks and crustaceans and things that live in the sandy bottom here. And this is a top predator in the food chain. Now, how many of you think you'd like to go swimming like we are in shark-infested waters? Go ahead and shout out if you like swimming with sharks. <laughs> There's a couple brave souls. You know, the funny thing is, people tend to be afraid of sharks because of a lot of the stuff we see about them on television, and we hear about shark attacks. But shark attacks, while they do happen are very rare. And look at this guy. He's just probably taking a nap almost in my hands. Yeah. These, these animals tend to be nocturnal. They're out during the nighttime feeding. During the daytime, they will hide in the bottom. You can see how its coloring helps it to camouflage in. It uses the kelp forest, relies on that for protection that way. But sharks have a lot more to fear from people than people do from sharks in general because while well, there are a few unfortunate shark attacks on people around the world each year, millions of sharks get attacked and killed by people many times just for their fins. And their numbers are declining. And as top predators, if they're removed from the ecosystem, from that web of life, it can cause an entire breakdown of the system. So... We're really happy to see this shark in the water here. And let's actually see, Josh, I'll let it maybe swim off this way. Let's see if we get a nice shot of it swimming through the kelp. And you can see how graceful it is. And so that's a sign of us being in a healthy kelp forest here. So we've seen, we were talking about pollution before Andrew found that shark. And how many of you think, you know, we're 15 to 25 miles offshore, depending on where in the Channel Islands we are. Today it's about 11 miles. How many of you think there would be pollution out here this far away from the mainland? Yeah, yeah. yeah unfortunately. Now there's less. The waters here are cleaner than waters closer to the mainland because there are less people here there's left less runoff affecting us but there is still some pollution what do you guys think po the, might be the most common type of pollution here at the channel islands in the ocean or one of the most plastics 
plastic. I heard it. Someone said plastic. <laughs> and so, <laughs> what was the other guess? Trash. 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 Yeah, and those are the same thing in many ways. So plastics float around all the areas of the ocean. There's almost no place in the ocean that is immune to it, and they don't break down very readily and when they do they'll break down it's almost more dangerous because these tiny little bits and pieces get ingested by the animals and it causes them harm other types of trash will also make its way sometimes by blowing into the ocean or washing down storm drains and eventually out to sea so even though we're protected here this is an area that has that still faces some threats what do you think you can do Simple little things to help protect kelp forests like this. Let's go back to Ventura, buddy. Any idea? Stand by. Maybe. Throw your garbage away. Yeah. Easy question, easy answer. And an easy action to do. So these little things add up. And if you come out here and you see plastic floating around on the surface or getting caught up in the kelp beds, it's really sad to see that. And it does have, as I said, a detrimental effect on the life here. And so just by throwing our plastics away, those little water bottle tops, things like that, we can help a little bit at a time improve the bigger picture in the ocean. So today we've seen a few examples of that chart. It's a really nice example of some of the animals that rely on the kelp forest for survival. And we've talked a little bit about how this being protected as a reserve, it's an area that has a more natural balance of life. And one of the things that happens, as I mentioned early on, is that when changes occur, areas that have a fuller, more natural ecosystem or naturally functioning ecosystem are able to bounce back. All of this kelp you're seeing today that Josh has been showing you has grown back since last winter when we had the El Nino storms. Warming waters and big surge killed off and tore up all the kelp and all the animals that rely on it were affected by that. But this area has come back so quickly once the water's cooled that we once again have a lush, thriving kelp forest. If this area were not protected the way it is, it would be harder for it to come back during these changes that occur in the cycles of weather and atmospheric cycles down here. So I hope you all have a better understanding after seeing this as to how marine reserves do help to protect the diversity and abundance of life down here. And that's important to all of us, not just those animals here, not just us today participating and watching this program, but kelp that's all around me here and other marine algaes actually provide much of the oxygen that goes into the air we breathe. So I'd like all of you to take a deep breath along with me and realize that a lot of that air you just breathed, a lot of the oxygen came from healthy kelp forests. So I encourage all of you to do what you can, throw your trash away properly, do what you can to help protect the ocean for all of us now and for future generations as well. So for those of you in Ventura, I know you're eager probably to get back out there in your kayaks and sailboats and enjoy the harbor in the ocean. Go play on the ocean. And for those of you here on Anacapa, I'll see you on the surface in just a moment. Thank you guys for joining us today. Goodbye. Channel is live. Bye-bye.